to me, zero waste in a household, because, uh, you know, it, uh, zero waste might be, mean something different from a city, for a manufacturer, and from a household. So in our household, zero waste means trying to reduce our trash as much as possible. And uh, we think we've done that because we produce just one jar of trash per year for our family of four. It ultimately translates into a simpler life, a life based on experiences instead of stuff, a life based on being instead of having. And that to us is what makes life richer. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 343. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here to take your health to the next level. Each week, we will bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, we are speaking with Bea Johnson. She's the best-selling author of Zero Waste Home. Her and her family produce a mere pint of trash per year since 2008. She's dubbed the mother of the zero waste lifestyle movement by CNN and has been featured on TV shows and in publications all over the world. She shatters misconceptions, proving that zero waste can not only be stylish, but also lead to significant health benefits and time and money savings. We had such a great conversation with Bea. I know you're going to get a lot out of this. And some of the highlights we discussed are the five rules to get to zero waste, strategies for minimizing junk mail, giving gifts that create memories, Bea's failed zero waste experiments, how zero waste is about recycling less, not more, and we talk about garbage and what really happens when it goes to the landfill. And you might be surprised at what you learn there. So much great information in this one. We'd love it for you to help spread the good word and share this with somebody in your life, a friend, a family member, somebody who can benefit from this information. We really appreciate you helping spread the good word. So without further ado, here we go with Bea Johnson. Hi, Bea. How are you? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. We're excited to chat with you. We have a lot to get into. And where I want to start off is talking about your story coming from France to California. And I know you made this move at 18 and you were on a year-long contract as an au pair. So what motivated you to come to the U.S.? To learn English. (laughs) And it was really, truly just that. When I, uh, when I graduated from high school, I did not quite uh, know what to do. I wasn't decided on a path or on a, on a major. So I thought, okay, I'll take a year off to at least learn English. I had really, really bad grades in high school in English. <laughs> Everyone would make fun of me every time I opened my mouth. So I thought, okay, maybe I can do that for a year. But then the problem is I fell in love. With Scott, who later on became your husband. Exactly. What happens? You guys fall in love and I know you end up traveling around the world. How long does it take you to start that adventure? After about six months of being married, we moved to Europe for my husband's job. So we lived in London, then Amsterdam, then Paris. But also during that uh, time, he took a six months leave so that we could do a trip around the world. Actually, we got back to France. I uh, became pregnant and I really wanted to come back to the U.S. to experience the soccer mom way of life as seen on TV, (laughs) the American way of life as seen on TV. And so for a few years, we lived in the suburbs of San Francisco, but it was way out. So we had to get into a car to go to the grocery store, restaurants, schools. You know, we basically had to hop into a car to do just about anything. So the life that we had known in the big cities we had lived in, in London, Paris, Amsterdam, that life we kind of missed because we were able to walk and bike everywhere. And so we decided after seven years of living out in the suburbs to move closer to a town to have amenities within walking or biking distance. And so that also our kids could go to school by bike. But before finding the right house, we rented an apartment for one year And we only moved in with the necessities. And what we discovered during that year is that when you live with less, then all of a sudden you have more time, more time in your hands to do what's important to you. More time for friends, family, picnics, hikes. And so when we found the right house in that downtown, we got everything out of storage. And we found that 80% of the stuff that we had put in there, we hadn't even missed for a whole year. So we let go of them. And it's thanks to that simplicity that we also found time to read books and watch documentaries on environmental issues, which made my husband and I sad thinking about the future that we as parents were creating for our children. And that's what gave us the motivation to change. 
through that process, you said you let go of 80% of what you had? Yes. And what did that look like? How did you go about strategically going through your items and deciding what to hang on to? I know you had the whole year of being more minimalistic, but when it came time to really get in there and decide what to keep, what did you do? Well, for example, uh, next to my stove, I used to have a jar filled with accessories. I had about 10 stirring spoons. Until I, it dawned on me that when I stir, it's only with one hand, one spoon. So what's the point of having 10 of them? One is enough. So in the past, I used to have uh, three sets of dishes. It was one set of china that had been a wedding gift from friends, but I never picked the china. So I was never in love with the design. So I had bought a second set, a white one, to be the one for special occasions, but that I actually liked. And then we had the everyday set. But when I simplified my life, I realized, you know, it's kind of stupid to only be using that nice set once a year or twice a year when we could be actually enjoying it every day. So the nice set, the one that I like, the basic white one became our everyday one. And so then I sold the other ones. I used to have lots of different types of sheets. You know, we had several sets per bed. Now we have one set of sheets per bed. We had lots of different types of towels. And then I realized, you know, we just need one towel <laughs> for each member of the family. And then one extra if we go to the pool, the beach, or, you know, if friends come over. It's really questioning that moment or that time in our life was really questioning our consumption. What are we hanging on to and why? Is it because society is telling us that we should have several sheets of bed per bed or, or is it because we really need it? And so that's how little by little we let go of 80%. Now it's even way more than 80. Uh, we are left with uh, <laughs> probably 5%. It's so important that you have that experiment because without that, you wouldn't have necessarily known because so many of us live in this culture of overabundance where we have multiples and multiples of everything. So it was just an amazing opportunity for you to reevaluate that. So for people who are listening who maybe don't get the chance to, you know, have a downsizing experiment or like living in something smaller, what are some beginning steps they can take to start to limit the over quantity of items in their home. In my book, Zero Waste Home, I talk about my method of five rules to get to zero waste. And two of them are actually the first three ones are very much about basically learning how to live with less. The first rule of our lifestyle is to refuse what we do not need. We've simply learned to say no because we've realized that in this consumer society where the targets of many, many promotional goods whether it be junk mail, business cards, plastic bags, straws, the free pen from a conference, the swag bag from a fair, you know, the free toothbrush from a dentist. But every time we accept those things, we are creating a demand to make more. And once we bring these things into our homes, not only does it clutter our space, but it also becomes our trash problem down the line. So when you learn to live simply, the first thing you need to do is to learn to say no to the things that you do not need. They say that to change just one habit, it might take three weeks. And it might take you three weeks just to learn to say no to the stuff that society is trying to give you. It might take you three weeks to stop having that robotic gesture of, uh, you know, reaching out when someone is trying to give you something. It's important to also find a sentence that makes it easy for you to learn to say no. In my case, I say, no, thanks. It's really nice of you, but I don't need one. Or no, thanks. It's really nice of you, but I'm a minimalist. When you have that sentence, that go-to sentence, it really makes it easy. It makes it automatic. And the person that's trying to give you something, they're not going to force it onto you. They just respect your choice. And once you learn to say no, you'll be amazed how much stuff you can stop from coming into your home. And I'm sure over time, people start to learn that, you know, you are a minimalist and you don't even have to necessarily say anything. People just know that's the way you are. Well, what's amazing is, you know, I give a, a lot of speaking engagements throughout the world and I talk about refusing and I talk about the fact that I don't accept business cards. But at the end of my talks, you always have someone <laughs> that's going to try to give me their business card or their handmade soap. I mean, people are always trying to pound me with stuff. Now, last week I was on a speaking tour in Mexico and I did refuse a bottle of mezcal and it's probably the hardest thing 
I have ever reused. <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful bottle of mezcal that is on. They only make 50 bottles a year. But you know, the container was opened. My whole wardrobe fits in a carry-on. So I obviously only travel with a carry-on and there was no room for it in the, my carry-on for that bottle of mezcal. So I, I refused it. Let's talk about junk mail because this is something that all of us have to encounter often on a daily basis. So during your zero waste journey, you actually went to war with junk mail. And I just love to hear your strategy for somebody that wants to, you know, get started and minimize that mail that's coming in day in, day out. Yeah. So I give all the, you know, the tips in the book, but really essentially what you need to do is go to preoptoutscreen.com and that will take you off the credit card offers. Then you go to dmachoice.org to get your name off uh, their list. And that will take you off the direct mailing list. You also have catalogchoice.org. That's to take your name off any catalog. I mean, I'm sarcastic, but you made a horrible mistake of uh, donating money to a charity. And they now have your address. And they now send you a bunch of junk mail. Actually, one of the organizations that for me was the hardest to take my name off of was uh, the Sierra Club. <laughs> it's uh, kind of uh, ironic, but uh, the Sierra Club is, uh, you know, an environmental type organization. Getting my name off of that mailing list was extremely difficult. It drove me crazy because they were sending me maps, magnets, stickers. I mean, a really a super thick envelope filled with junk. And I realized, okay, that's obviously how they're spending people's money. And I don't want to be part of that. So uh, I called them several times. And in that case, the only way I was able to get their attention was to uh, sadly post a negative uh, review on Yelp. But eventually, yeah, I got the name off. There are two things that you can't eliminate. It's uh, if you have teenagers taking SATs and ACTs, I could not find a way of stopping all the college advertisement that came after that. Somehow, when your child takes uh, those tests, they are automatically put on mailing lists. And it was really frustrating. But somehow, as soon as you pick a school, the word gets out and they stop sending you mail. So the trick here is to do early decision or <laughs> early action. The second mailing that you can't eliminate, because it's also coming up, is uh, during the elections. If uh, you have an undecided party, then you're going to receive all the mail from all parties. If you've decided on a party, then at least you're going to you know, just get that one. So the easiest thing here is to pick a party. <laughs> and I was just wondering if you knew of anything that someone could put on their mailbox that tells the mail person not to give them any junk mail. We're in Canada. I think a couple of years ago, I came across something that people had had it was like a red sticker, I completely forget the organization, where if you had that on your mailbox, the mail person is legally obligated not to put junk mail in there. I don't know if there's anything like that or you know of anything. Yeah, the rules are different for every part of the world. So in the US, they are required by law to deliver a piece of mail that is addressed to you. There is nothing that you can put on your mailbox to stop it. Now, I don't know if in Canada it's different, but it could as well be because in Europe, indeed, there are stickers that you can just put on your mailbox that says, please, no junk mail, and the mailman will not put any in there. So I wish that was the case in the U.S., but it's not. So that's why you really have to take steps to fight it, you know, at the source. Yeah, I'm committed to looking into this and finding out what it was. If it was just a temporary thing, because I haven't seen it since. And I definitely want to get it because right now we actually have a post-it on our mailbox that's just written in, you know, marker that just says, no junk mail, please. So has it made a difference? I want to say that we've had less flyers. Like, I do want to say that, like, I've noticed a bit of a difference, but there's the odd thing that still gets in there. But like, yeah, I feel like we're just getting the mail that's addressed to us. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It could be that, uh, you know, for the ones that, you know, don't have your name and address on it, it's fine. They don't have to put it in. But even where I live, if it says postal customer and doesn't have an address on it, but it has, it comes from the city, they are going to deliver it and there is nothing you can do about it. So it's really going to the source and attacking those sources. And, and at first, you know, for me, it was like almost like a full-time job. The kids were doing their homework and I was tackling junk mail, but it was work really or time very well invested doing that work because it's amazing how much time it saves not having to deal with it later. 
And is there something you can write on the envelope and return it to sender that'll get you taken off the list? Or have you done anything like that? So that is something you can do. But I mean, again, I don't know if the rules are different in Canada, but that's something you can only do for first class mail. Third class mail is a junk mail that is really cheap. It's a slow mail and it does not include a return to sender. But if it's a first class mail, first class mail does include a return to sender. And in that case, yes, you can write refuse to sender. And then you can write in the back of the envelope, please take me off your mailing list. Now, I find that it's much more efficient to actually call the people because you, you're literally talking to the person and you're, you're having them doing it on the phone as you speak to them. If uh, you write it on the envelope, they might just ignore it. So you never know. Now we're going to take a quick break from our chat with Bea to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. And today I want to highlight the Perfect Keto Keto Bars. These are keto-friendly bars that only contain 3 grams of net carbs. They have no sugar, no sugar alcohols, no additives or fillers, and they can be used in so many different ways. If you're in a rush in the morning, they make a great breakfast on the go. They make an awesome midday snack, and you can use them before or after workouts. And if you're traveling, say you're going on a flight or a long car ride, you can take them with you and have them as a snack. And you can even have them as dessert as they taste delicious. The bars come in a wide range of flavors, including their new flavor, birthday cake, which I love. They also have cinnamon roll, chocolate chip cookie dough, which is my current favorite, salted caramel, almond butter brownie, and lemon poppy seed. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide, and if you live in the U.S., they provide free shipping. Go and get yourself some of the Perfect Keto Keto Bars today. They are such a versatile snack, you're going to love them. Now we're going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Organifi. Organifi has an incredible product called Immunity, and it's an immune-boosting superfood blend. And when you buy it, it comes in a box with 14 single-serve packets that are great for on the go. All you need to do is rip open a packet, mix it with water, and drink it back. So super easy to use and tastes great. The ingredients include orange juice powder, beta-glucan from reishi mushroom, acerola extract, turmeric powder, olive leaf, zinc, and ginger extract. So it's absolutely loaded. And you can take the product ahead of time before you get sick to give your immunity a boost and hopefully prevent the cold or flu from coming on. Or you can take it after the fact to help fight the symptoms and duration of a cold or flu. So it's a great product to have on hand at all times. And the whole Organifi lineup is USDA organic, gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. All things we love to see. And as a listener of our show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Go and get yourself some of the Organifi immunity today. You won't regret it. And now back to our chat with Bea. I do want to get back into the five R's and cover the other four. But first, I want to come back to your story. And I just want to clarify a little bit. You mentioned the experiment and how that was a catalyst for getting into a more minimalistic lifestyle. But you also mentioned doing some reading and watching some documentaries at that time. So was this all intertwined in part of this big lifestyle shift towards zero waste? Yes, totally. Um, I mean, it's uh, funny. I've, I've grown up watching The Little House on the Prairie. And when we simplified our lives, we actually uh, turned off cable and then uh, we had time in the evenings to read. But I had never read the Little House on Prairie books. So I picked them up and read them and I, they uh, definitely uh, got me thinking even more about adopting a simple life. There is also some books on simplicity that I read and then some on environmentalism. For example, there is a book that I really enjoyed that's called Slow Death by Rubber Duck. It talks about all the toxic products that surround us in our daily lives. For example, the cleaner that you use or the uh, Teflon in your pan or the Scotch guard on your couch or the Gore-Tex on your jacket. And once you read that, there is no way you can keep (laughs) using those products. That's when I really tackled the toxicity type uh, products. Yeah, the toxicity in our home to make it uh, even a clean home. 
And, you know, a lot of people ask me, I mean, so what did you do with your cleaning products? Well, you know, we went from a cabinet filled with cleaning products to just cleaning with white vinegar and water. And at first, I, I must say, I was worried that I was putting the health of my family at risk because I still had all the promotions in my head, you know, the promoters that the cleaning industry will have you, have you believe that to clean different surfaces, you need different products and you have to kill the germs, you know, in this uh, fight in killing the germs, we're killing the good germs too. And that we need germs uh, to survive. And once I decided to let go of the cleaning products, I, I did feel scared about putting the health of my family at risk. But in the end, we found that we're actually way less sick than before just using white vinegar and water than using all the toxic products we were using. People ask me, well, what did you do with those toxic products? Well, if uh, they're still sold in the stores, that means that there are still people buying them. So you just have to find those people, put it for free on Craigslist. It's uh, much better for people to have access to a secondhand toxic product than a new one. And so that's what I did. I put up a lot of my products for free and the people that are still buying it on the store, you know, within five minutes, they came and picked it up for me. To clarify here, it seems like the zero waste lifestyle encompasses so many different things. You got rid of a lot of your physical possessions. You cleaned up the products you're using to clean your home. And you're also obviously conscious about the waste you're creating. So is all this under that big category of zero waste or how do you define zero waste? To me, zero waste in a household, because, uh, you know, the zero waste might be, mean something different from a city for a manufacturer and from a household. So in our household, zero waste means trying to reduce our trash as much as possible. And uh, we think we've done that because we produce just one jar of trash per year for our family of four. It ultimately translates into a simpler life, a life based on experiences instead of stuff, a life based on being instead of having. And that to us is what makes life richer. When you guys make this big lifestyle shift and go to zero waste, is your husband on board right away or how does he react? After reading those books and uh, re uh, watching those documentaries, my husband quit his job to start a sustainability consulting company and I tackled the home. And I remember one day at the dinner table, we had this uh, argument where he said, well, my work is more important than what you do at home. And I told him I, I don't agree because I really think that the manufacturing world is led by consumers. Manufacturers only make what consumers buy. So if consumers can buy differently, then it will change the manufacturing world. And it's really, I really believe that change is in the consumer's hands. I've proven that what we were doing at home could actually initiate a global movement. What we've done at home has inspired millions of people to do the same in their households. It's also inspired manufacturers to change their practices. It's inspired unpackaged shops to open uh, throughout the world. Along the way, it's also shown my husband that what we were doing at home did have a huge impact. Now, when I really started going to the grocery store with my own kit of reusables, and I was also going to the farmer's market, you know, we started in the midst of the recession and the farmer's market and the health food store have a reputation of costing more. So my husband, you know, because he had started this uh, sustainability consulting company, we didn't have any money coming in and things were financially very, very difficult at home. And he said, hey, stop, you know, we can't afford to go uh, buy our groceries at the health food store. We can't afford to go to the farmer's market. At that point, I asked him to compare our bank statements between the zero waste lifestyle and the lifestyle before zero waste. And that's when he discovered that we were saving 40% on our overall budget. And my husband is a business numbers kind of guy. Once he saw that number, he said, amen, Bea, keep going. He never questioned it again. And he was completely on board. Wow, that's such a big dip in the numbers going down 40%. And it's interesting because that allows so much to change within your lifestyle as well, I'm sure. I mean, you don't have the financial pressures. You talked about being pretty strapped for cash at the time. But if a family does this and, and has more money in the bank, they can maybe make investments or they can maybe go from full-time work to part-time work, start spending more time with the family. So it's really interesting, this financial aspect of this new lifestyle. Those financial savings are based on the fact that, one, we consume way, 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 way less than before. Learning to say no, but also going through a decluttering process when we adopted a simple life. All of that has made us think twice about bringing anything into the household, about buying anything. 
So for example, in the past, uh, when we went on vacation, I'd bring back souvenirs. Or if my mother-in-law visited, we'd go shopping. So we were constantly adding to the number of things we had in our house. Today, we are minimalists, but we're comfortable. We're no longer adding to the number of things we have. If we buy something, it's only to replace what needs to be replaced. And if we buy that replacement, we buy it secondhand. But we also buy our products unpackaged. When you buy something packaged, 15% of the price or more covers the cost of the packaging. So, of course, this is not a cost that the manufacturer is covering. It's a cost that's put on the back of the consumer. So when you buy unpackaged, you make automatic financial savings. But we've also replaced anything disposable for a reusable alternative. So that means that we're no longer throwing our money away. And that's the third rule, reuse. Reusing is swapping anything that is disposable for a reusable alternative and buying secondhand if we have to buy something. So swapping all these disposables for reusables has translated into huge cumulative savings over time. They are such that they've even allowed us to install solar panels on our roof and a gray water system, which re, uh, recycles the water from our showers and washes to irrigate our plants. So it saves us even more. But the best advantage of this lifestyle is really the simple life and the fact that we've been able to uh, divert these financial savings from spending on unnecessary consumption to spending more time with our family, funding activities, experiences as a family. Again, that's what, uh, to me, the best advantage of this lifestyle is a life of experiences instead of stuff, a life of being instead of having. So your kids have essentially been raised more or less with this lifestyle, and now they're teenage boys. Tell us about how they embrace this too and bring this to their friends, to their school, whatever engagements that they have in their life. Yeah, so we started about 13 years ago. My kids are now 20 and 18, so they have left the nest. We dropped off the youngest one just a few months ago at university. So indeed, they have lived longer without waste than they have with waste. What we do in our household is to them completely normal and automatic. When you grow up a certain way with a certain diet or a certain religion, you take it for granted. You don't question it. And in our case, uh, you know, the kids simply uh, were raised with a zero waste diet. And so what we were doing became completely normal and automatic. It's not like we pounded them with environmental facts. So in the end, I, I realized that actually it was up to me to do zero waste in the household because it's the parents really that consume for the household. The parents are the ones with the credit cards. The parents are the ones that are buying the stuff and the, buying the packaged products and buying the disposables. And so in the end, zero waste is more the decisions that the consumer for the household does outside of their home. It's when that the person that consumes for the household chooses not to consume or consume differently by buying products and package and buying necessities secondhand. And since I was the one making those decisions for the household, it was up to me to do zero waste. And in the end, zero waste became completely unnoticed in our household. We had already a package-free pantry for six months that my kids had not even noticed. I took my youngest son on a field trip to the health food store with his school. And in front of the bulk bins, the teacher asked, why is it good to buy in bulk? And my son just sat there. He didn't say anything. And oh my God, I wanted to slap him in the back of the head and like, answer, you know the answer to this. But it dawned on me on my way home that I had done zero waste. And in the end, it had gone completely unnoticed. It's not like a family was doing this and we had chosen to do like what they're doing. Basically, we took the goal of zero waste. When we took it on as a goal, it was not used to describe a lifestyle. It was a term that was used in the manufacturing world. It was a term used to describe waste management practices at a city level. It was not a term to describe domestic household chores. But, you know, when I saw that term, it gave me a goal. But there were no books, no blogs, no guide on how to eliminate trash from a household in our modern era. So I had to test a lot of things, test a lot of extremes. But over time, I found a balance that worked for our family. I found simple alternatives that we could stick to in the long run for life without making zero waste difficult or depriving. And in the end, it became normal and automatic. 
I can't predict the future. I have no idea if my kids are going to do zero weights when I grow up. And that actually, believe it or not, it does not matter to me. All that matters to me is to know that as a mom, I have given them the tools to do it if they choose to do it. What's crazy to me is that when I give talks in schools, in middle schools, for example, in the U.S., you have kids that ask me what we do with the handkerchiefs once we use them. They ask me if we compost our handkerchiefs. And I'm like, no, we wash them to reuse. And they're like, ah, oh, you, that's gross. But that's because it's a generation that does not know what handkerchiefs are. They've never grown up with them. They've never seen them. They've never used them. And if, uh, you know, we give them the tools to do zero waste, if we said, hey, here, here are the handkerchiefs, you do zero waste, they wouldn't even know what to do with them. They would be composting the handkerchiefs. So in the case of our kids, they know what to do with the handkerchiefs. They have the tools. They know what to do if they choose to do zero waste. I'm actually more worried about the daughters-in-law I'm going to get because I have two boys, so two daughters-in-law down the line, and they might have grown up with the paper towels. They might want them. Who knows? Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. What about the kids that have grown up with paper towels and living a more conventional life? Your case is interesting because the kids were so young when you adopted this new lifestyle, but what do you say to the parent out there who's listening to this? And they're going to start to make these changes, but they have kids that are in their teens already and they have these routines established and they're used to doing things a certain way. How do you gently bring this into a household and start to make those changes? Whether you're trying to bring this change to a teenager or a husband that's not on board with this or a wife that's not on board with this, you have to find what will make them click. I am sure, you know, teenagers, in the end, all they need is a smartphone, a computer, and a few pieces of clothing that make them feel like they fit in. I mean, personally, when I was a kid, I was always wearing the same clothes. And actually, uh, adults also do that. And so it's not that teenagers need a lot of stuff. You need to show them what is it that they actually need and feel comfortable enough to let go of the rest When you let go, you make it available to your community. You make it available to other people so other people can have access to those things. In the case of uh, our kids, you know, when they became uh, teenagers, I was going clothes shopping twice a year at the beginning of two big seasons, mid-October and mid-April. So the beginning, you know, of two big seasons, but I would go to the thrift store, one giant thrift store where there is a lot of choices, lots of products, lots of different types of clothing. But before going, I would ask my kids very specifically, what is it that you want me to buy for you? Because I didn't want them coming back to me 10 years down the line to say, oh, in our house, we could never wear a Quicksilver t-shirt or or an O'Neill t-shirt or Puma shoes. So I kept a very open mind, open ear to their needs and wants. And if uh, they feel that they uh, needed or wanted a Quicksilver t-shirt, then I put that on that shopping list for the thrift store. I made sure to bring back the things that they had asked for. So from the time that they were little until the time that they left the household, of course, they went through lots of different styles. Yeah, Leo, the young one, was uh, little. He really liked those surfer types of T-shirts, straight jeans, but then uh, his tight chance and he wanted the skinny jeans, different colors with V-neck T-shirts uh, with no logos. But, you know, as he evolved through these different styles, I found all these things secondhand for him. And so in the end, They ended up, you know, going to school like uh, I do in the world, uh, looking just like any person. They felt that they had what they needed to fit in. So they didn't feel like they were deprived with this. It's just that they were wearing secondhand clothing, but no one knows it's secondhand. No one needs to know. So it doesn't matter to them. In the the end, they present themselves just like any teenager. And really what makes our kids different from other kids is not the amount of trash that we produce. They don't care because to them, it's completely normal. What really makes them different, and that's really, I think, what strikes a core for a lot of teenagers, is the activities that we've been able to do as a family, the amazing things that we've done. My youngest son, who's 18, he's already traveled to 33 countries. For their birthdays, they didn't get crap. They got bungee jumping or skydiving. My oldest one, for Christmas, I gave him an axe-throwing class. <laughs> He's always like to throw knives. And I found that where he lives in Montreal, they have an axe throwing class. So I gave him that and he loved it. And, you know, of course, I included a bunch of his friends in the activity. So it's a gift that is so much better than stuff because it creates memories and memories last forever. Stuff doesn't. 
Now we're going to take another quick break from our chat with Bea to give a shout out to our show partner, Thrive Market. Thrive Market has an incredible lineup of health and wellness products all in one place that are delivered right to your door. Their foods are non-GMO and they sell the best organic brands. They also have clean beauty products, safe supplements, and non-toxic home products. They make it easy to find exactly what you're looking for by searching by your diet and values. So you can search under food, pet, home, new products, vitamins and supplements, and so on. And you can even get really specific and search for the type of diet you consume, whether it be paleo, keto, vegan, vegetarian, or raw. And when you shop at Thrive, you're not only loading up on products that are good for you, but also good for the planet. They have carbon neutral shipping, 100% recyclable packaging, and zero waste warehouses. When shopping at Thrive, you get 20 to 50% off what you'd spend in a typical health food store. And as a listener of our show, you get 25% off your first order with a maximum $20 discount and a free 30-day membership. This is for our U.S. listeners only. To take advantage of your discount, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Thrive Market. Go and give Thrive a try today. They make shopping and eating healthy so easy. I also want to give a shout out to our other show partner, Juve. Juve is a red light therapy device you can install right in your home and it emits red and near-infrared light. And we have a Juve device installed on the back of our door and it's something I've been using regularly for quite some time as part of my health and wellness routine. And when I'm Juving, I'm listening to a podcast, so I'm learning and getting the health benefits of the Juve at the same time, making the most of that time. And some of these benefits include sleep optimization, skin health, and helping decrease inflammation. And sometimes I'll even bring a coffee or tea downstairs when I'm juving and sip on that at the same time and make it a whole experience. And the way to look at juve is like a light supplement. So it's something you're using in addition to getting a healthy dose of light from the sun. The majority of the juve devices are modular, meaning you can start with one piece and add to it over time. And we're currently using the Duo, which is two of the solo devices stacked on top of each other. So when we're getting a treatment done, we're getting head-to-toe coverage within that 8-20 to minute treatment. And you can try Juve Modular Device today risk-free, so you get a 60-day hassle-free return policy on your purchase. And to invest in a Juve, all you need to do is go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Juve. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Juve. And Juve is spelled J-O-O-V-V and stands for rejuvenation. And as a listener of our show, you're going to get a free gift with your Juve purchase. I mentioned before how Juve is now a regular part of my healthy routine, and it's definitely a great addition to any healthy lifestyle. So go and get yours today. And now back to our chat with Bea. Well, when they were kids growing up, I know what you guys would do is each and every month you'd surprise them and take them out to do an activity and do something new that they hadn't tried before, which is just a great idea. We, uh, for uh, a few Christmases, we gave them a uh, what we call a subscription to an SFA. SFA is Secret Family Activity. So that subscription, you know, is like a, would be like a magazine subscription. But instead of getting a magazine, we do a family activity together. So yeah, we did some really odd things. One of them, and doesn't it really doesn't have to be expensive. One of them was to go to a, a boardwalk and uh, eat uh, crickets dipped in chocolate. <laughs> Another one was to rent the rowboats that we had seen at the Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. We had never gone on them and we were like, gosh, that'd be kind of fun. So we uh, rented a couple of rowboats, went around the whole park. And one was like indoor skydiving. I mean, some are more expensive than others, but they don't have to be. It can be really simple. It could be you know, going away for the weekend and spending the night in a weird hotel. Like we've stayed in a teepee, in a treehouse, in a lighthouse, in a cave. And if you're wondering also what to do, what types of gifts to give, you can look at uh, Groupon, Viator, Airbnb experiences. Those are all good sources of ideas of unusual activities that are available where you live, but also might be available where the person that you want to give a gift to are available. So that's how Airbnb experiences is, for example, where I found that axe throwing class for my 20 year old in Montreal. And I'm just curious, when did you start sharing things publicly, these life changes you're making? 
we started Simplify Our Life, like the move I was talking about earlier was done in 2006. 2006 to 2007 is when we discovered the simple life. 2007 is when we bought the vintage house, which happened to be a third of the size of the previous one. And then uh, from 2007 to 2008, we really let go of all the things we didn't need, that those 80% we were talking about. And then in 2008 is when I uh, stumbled upon the term zero waste and took it on as a goal for our household. In 2009, I decided to share the solutions that I had discovered, thinking, okay, if someone else is interested in uh, reducing their trash, they can you know, use the solutions I discovered. And then in uh, 2010, the New York Times wrote an article about us. So that was uh, the first time that we exposed our our lifestyle to mainstream, but there were no pictures in the article. So people said, I mean, we got horrible, horrible criticism. People said, I'm sure they're like hippies living in the woods. I'm sure she doesn't shave her legs. And that's where also people laughed at us and saying, it's uh, ridiculous. Uh, What they do at home uh, won't have an impact because they're just one family. We got a lot of attention from international media. Then I wrote the book, which is now translated in 27 languages. So all of these things together allow me to share my message far and wide. I also do speaking engagements throughout the world. I've spoken three times at the United Nations. I've spoken at the European Parliament, but also IKEA, Amazon, Starbucks, L'Oreal, through lots of different cities throughout the world. I've spoken in 70 different countries, but all of that has really allowed me to share my message as far and wide as possible. My vocation is really to shatter the misconceptions associated with this lifestyle to show that a zero-waste lifestyle is not just good for the environment, it actually is also good for your health, it's better for your wallet, and best of all, it improves one standard of living. Well, part of your story in the early days is trying these experiments, and you actually went pretty extreme with things, then kind of found your way back to the middle. So I'd love to talk about some of these failed experiments that you've had over the years, starting with the stinging nettle when you use that on your lips. Well, I had what you would call a typical cosmetic pouch. But in my cosmetic pouch, I had a lip plumper. And uh, for the guys out there who might not know what a lip plumper is, it's a glass with an ingredient in it that tingles your lips and it's supposed to make them bigger. Honestly, it's total BS. I've actually measured my lips. I've measured the before and after and there was no augmentation. But in my head, because it uh, tingled my lips, it made me feel like he was doing something. So I was determined to find a, a natural alternative. So one day I googled natural way of plumping your lips. And I found this YouTube video of this beautiful woman with beautiful, thick uh, lips. And she says that uh, all we needed was stinging nettle, that if we remove, and she shows in the video how she removes the leaves from the twig, she rolls it on her lips. And she shows you result. I mean, a result that is quite amazing. And at that point, I thought, dang, how did I not think of that before her? It's freaking genius. So I went out uh, to the woods with gloves uh, to gather some stinging nettle. I brought it home. And then I proceeded to the instruction she had given in the video. But of course, I didn't end up with the, the same results. I Sure, I had, a, you know, I ended up with exploded lips, but not the right explosion because I, ex- uh, I ended up with hard red bumps a little bit everywhere. Not very attractive. I don't know what plant the woman was using in the video, but I can tell you that was not stinging nettle. <laughs> and then from that point, I realized, okay, the only natural way of having plump lips is to be born with them. So I've learned to simply accept what that God has given me. Another one of your extreme experiments was using moss as toilet paper. And I know this didn't last for too long. So tell us how that went. Uh, so I was taking at that time a botany class. And uh, one day we're in the woods with my teacher and she says, hey, if you're ever stuck in the woods with that toilet paper, the moss you see over there in the trees is amazing. It's nice, soft. Just like, uh, you know, awesome alternative to toilet paper. So in my head, I thought, oh, zero waste. Uh, you know, it's a zero waste alternative. So I filled the bucket with moss. I brought it home. But the problem, though, is that moss dries. So uh, we ended up with a bucket filled with, you know, those green scouring pads that people use to scrub their pots. Yeah, not very pleasant. So at that point, we decided, OK, forget about moss. Let's just stick to toilet paper. But we buy it from a restaurant and hotel supply store. So it's only sold uh, wrapped in paper. And it's also 100% recycled content. I want to let your listeners know or beg them to please not send me emails to tell me that we can do without toilet paper. That's something I'm obviously very aware of. We've considered all alternatives out there. 
and I realized that uh, most of the world does not use toilet paper. They use a bucket of water in their hand. But personally, where we live in California, it's not really part of our custom. So we'll stick to toilet paper. Thank you very much. I want to make sure we get back to the five R's. And the next one is recycle. And I think this is a really important one because I think a lot of people think that a zero waste lifestyle means recycling more, but you are very adamant that it's not about that at all, that it's actually about recycling less. So let's talk a little bit about this and why we want to avoid and not really rely on recycling as, as a means. Yeah, I did a whole TEDx talk on that because, uh, you know, it was frustrating to me that whenever I'd go to a party, it's not like I say, hey, by the way, I'm zero waste, but you have friends right away that say, oh, by the way, this is the zero waste family. And so then you have people coming to me to say, oh, we recycle everything too. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. I want to have fun at the party. I'm not going to go into it. But I really want people to understand that zero waste is not about recycling more. It's actually about recycling less by preventing waste from coming in your home in the first place, which is done with my first three R's. When you refuse as much as you can, when you reduce then what you could not refuse, when you reuse what you could not refuse and reduce, you're left with very little recycling. And so recycling is really for us the last resort before the landfill. The first three R's are the ones that allow you to have control over the material. Once you put it on a curb, once you put it in a recycling bin, you have no idea what's going to happen to it. China has a, there is a, the China ban in place for uh, plastics because they got tired of getting all our plastic crap from the U.S., or I should say our plastic crap back uh, <laughs> to them from the U.S. And they, uh, they're they getting a lot of contamination in their recycling, uh, or the recyclable materials that we're sending them, and they got tired of it. I mean, and it's right. I mean, we shouldn't treat other countries like a landfill. So they've put a ban in place where they only accept very clean recyclables. So they no longer accept a certain amount or percentage of contamination. It's harder than ever to recycle those materials. And I want also people to understand that the few plastics that have the chance of being recycled are turned into an item that will no longer be recyclable. So when they turn a plastic bottle into a park bench, that park bench is no longer recyclable. It's meant for the landfill. These are the reasons why we try to avoid plastics at all costs. If we recycle, we favor metal. I mean, even in all the materials that we buy secondhand, if we buy anything, we're thinking, okay, what is going to be the end of life of that item? If it's no longer repairable, can it be recycled? And that's why we favor glass for the things that uh, we purchase. That's why I use uh, glass containers to buy food uh, like meat, fish, dairy, cheese, anything wet into the, uh, glass containers. We also uh, like metal. That's why instead of plastic utensils uh, next to my stove, I use uh, they're all metal because it's a material that lasts longer, but it's also something that we're able to recycle if it breaks. I don't think they're going to break in my lifetime, but you never know. We also favor paper and cardboard. That's why, you know, we've uh, chosen the toilet paper wrapped in paper. And this is something that we're going to recycle. Paper and cardboard is recyclable up to eight times. And then sometimes we also choose wood, like our toothbrushes, for example, because that's a material that we can compost. So rot composting is the last rule of our zero waste lifestyle. And that's uh, for us the last resort uh, really before the landfill. But it's allowed us to give back to the earth some natural materials, like uh, the wooden toothbrush or the wooden brush that I use instead of sponges in the sink. The, of course, the fruit and veggie peels, but also the floor sweepings or my husband's hair, my kid's hair. I actually don't compost my hair. I recycle my the rest of my hair. I let it grow down to elbow length and then I cut it and I send it to an organization that makes wigs for cancer patients. There are lots of different organizations that do this. So every time I choose a different one. And while we're speaking of rot, I think it's important to get into what happens to those veggie scraps and fruit scraps if we're not composting them. Because for a long time, I just assumed that they went to the landfill and broke down and decomposed into dirt. And that's not the case. So talk about what happens if we're just throwing those in the garbage. Nothing decomposes in a landfill simply because the conditions are not there for things to decompose. There is a great book called Garbology that talks about all the story, all the, basically the thing, everything you've always wanted to know about trash. But he also talks about in there 
the fact that there is a university, and I can't remember which one it was, but they did a uh, core sample of a landfill. And they went down, I think it was 100 feet down. And it was very far down into a landfill. And at the tip of that core sample, at the bottom of that core sample, they found guacamole. Guacamole intact from 25 years ago. Nothing can decompose in a landfill. That guacamole was uh, packaged in uh, plastic and, you know, there is no air, no light, no nothing in there for it to decompose. So, and against that plastic, it has less chance to even do so. And then the problem also about sending things to the landfill is that it, uh, you know, it creates a methane gas, you know, it's a toxic gas and it's, uh, it also creates a toxic soup at the bottom of those landfills. And there are only very few, very well maintained uh, landfills that don't leach, but a lot of them around the world do. I visited a landfill actually in Mexico last week that has zero liner. So whatever you throw in that landfill is becoming a toxic soup. That landfill was right next to a dry riverbed. So when the rains come, the trash goes into the riverbed. And then you have also that toxic soup, which then is carried down to the ocean, but also along the way, it goes into your drinking water. I and mean, that just doesn't make any sense. Bea, we could keep talking to you for another hour. I know we got to let you go soon. Normally, we ask the question, what does ultimate health mean to you? But I think I want to steer this in the direction of where do you think this is going? Are things looking up in terms of the zero waste movement? You're getting out into the community quite a bit, speaking to people. What do you see for the future? People ask me if I'm an optimist or pessimist. I am definitely an optimist when you are part of the solution, when you're doing everything you can at your own personal level. That has a huge impact. It has the impact of inspiring others to do the same. Every day I receive uh, emails, messages from people all over the world that have been, you know, thanking me for inspiring them to adopt this lifestyle, which has then changed their life for uh, inspiring people to open unpackaged shops or starting their own line of reusable products. Basically, uh, even having inspired large corporations to change the way they do things. I'm really optimistic because I see things moving in the right direction. Of course, when I started 12 years ago, you know, I was, I felt maybe alone back then. But I knew that a lot of people were doing things and changing things. And along the way, I I mean, I would have never, ever thought in a million years that what we were doing at home could inspire millions of people. So uh, don't think that what you do at home doesn't have an impact. Yes, it does. Well, thank you. And you've got so many amazing resources between videos and TED Talks and articles and your book for sure, Zero Waste Home. I definitely want people to check those out, learn about your life. And one thing we didn't talk about that I wanted to talk about, but people can go and learn about is how to raise a zero waste dog. You've got your little dog, Zizu. So people need to go check that out. Other than that, where else can people connect with you? I'm on social media under at Zero Waste Home. I'm extremely transparent about what we do. I don't do promotions. I don't do sponsor posts. I just uh, turn them all down because I really think it's important for me to be as transparent and as clear and as uh, true to my following as possible. So uh, feel free to follow me on Zero Waste Home. Absolutely. You're so inspiring. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you very much to you guys for having me. Bea, I really appreciated the talk and enjoyed it. And keep doing the important work you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. What a great conversation with Bea. I hope you learned a lot. I definitely learned a lot in preparing for the interview and during our chat. And we'd love to learn what you took from the episode over on Instagram. So be sure and tag at Zero Waste Home and at Ultimate Health Podcast. You can take a picture of the player as you're listening to the show, or even better, take a video or picture of yourself listening. And we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, be sure and head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 343. We have links there to everything we discussed today in a show summary. Be sure and check that out. And before we let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, we really appreciate all the hard work you put in. Thank you so much. And this week's fun fact about Jace is that he's been going bowling lately with new friends, and he recently won a game. Polling is a lot of fun, Jace. Not something I've done in a lot of years. Glad you're getting out and being social and having fun. Have an awesome week. We'll talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.